I'm Mary Gallagher. I'm the director of the Center for Chinese Studies. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our public lecture and also to all the alum who returned for the 50th anniversary of the Center of Chinese Studies, which was founded in 1961. I'm glad to say that the weather did um, uh, turn badly for us so that you can feel like you truly came home to <laughs> Ann Arbor. Two weeks ago, it was 70 degrees and very sunny, and that was uh, not appropriate for a fall gathering at, uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, I'm actually not going to introduce, introduce Ken. I'm going to have uh, my colleague, Professor Nicholas Housen from the law school, uh, who is uh, very good at introductions and has <laughs> and has, uh, has known Ken for a little bit shorter than me, but who uh, did overlap with Ken when he was here. So uh, let me first introduce Nico Housen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I must say at the outset that I'm a bit confused because I thought I was here to present the Emmy to Jane Lieberthal uh, for her leading role in a long-running series called The Good Wife. Jane, are you here? Uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Ken and Jane are the proud uh, parents-in-law of a very famous actress who did just win an Emmy for her role in The Good Wife. So, um, But uh, in truth, my job tonight is to introduce Ken Lieberthal to you. Uh, and that's a rather difficult task for a crowd like this in Ann Arbor filled with former colleagues, uh, colleagues, friends, neighbors, and a lot of former students of Ken's at Michigan. Um, you all know the milestones of Ken's magnificent career. Uh, he finished uh, his PhD at Columbia University during the great proletarian cultural revolution. Um, he taught political science at Swarthmore College between uh, 1972 and 1983, and then came, uh, much to the delight of the University of Michigan, to the University of Michigan in 1983, where he labored until 1998, and then took a, a, a sojourn uh, at the uh, uh, government as, as a member of the National Security Council under President Clinton between 1998 and 2000. And just a personal note, I remember that Ken went to the National Security Council because, as I'll tell you in a minute, that's the time I met him. But I also remember being in Beijing before I actually met Ken and watching uh, a speech that President Clinton gave uh, near the end of his uh, administration on China, specifically on China, wholly on China. And I remember watching the television and thinking, that's a darn good speech. That's an incredibly insightful, intelligent speech about China and US-China relations. And of course, uh, uh, I discovered afterwards that most of that, I think, I don't know if you'll claim, uh, claim uh, authorship, but a lot of that was authored by uh, our very own Ken uh, Lieberthal. After his stint at the National Security Council, uh, Ken came back to uh, the Political Science Department and the Ross Business School at the University of Michigan from 2000 to 2009. Uh, and then in 2009, uh, much to our dismay, retired from the University of Michigan and moved to Washington to head up the uh, John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution, where he is currently uh, the director. Uh, it's obvious to all of us that Ken has excelled as a scholar, as a government official, as an advisor to governments, our own and other governments, and as a consultant uh, helping American companies and uh, European companies doing business in China. He's also marvelously prolific. Uh, my notes say that he has written or edited uh, over 18 uh, volume books and has his name on more than 70 uh, articles. But if I was going to uh, offer uh, ideas of Ken Lieberthal, I think I would locate them around three, uh, three ideas, three statements. One is uh, 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 the concept of insight and understanding. The second is access. And the third is uh, mentoring. Uh, Ken has always brought a tremendous amount of insight and really close understanding of China. Uh, uh, to us, to the nation, and to the world. I think I saw that, as I, uh, as I said, when I first met Ken in Beijing. He arrived in Beijing with uh, uh, a fellow named Larry Summers, who I think was then the Secretary of the Treasury. Some of us were invited to a small room to meet this august group, and I went uh, quaking, trembling, uh, to meet these, uh, these people. And I walked out of the room thinking that Summers was smart and accomplished, but really thinking that Lieberthal uh, had, the, uh, 
had 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 a real understanding of China uh, uh, f for the ages. Uh, we also saw that many of us use his wonderful book, which is in a second edition now called Governing China, uh, where he uh, effectively puts names to concepts and practices that we all understand. Uh, from living in China, he puts names to those those things to make them intelligible uh, uh, to us. The other thing in terms of insight and understanding from Ken is that he's always been a little bit ahead of the curve in understanding what's important in China. In my own work, uh, he was one of the first people to really attack the question of uh, offshore drilling, uh, 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 natural resource exploitation in China. This is in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. And of course, more recently, he's been a really uh, clarion voice discussing the environment and the impact of environmental degradation on uh, China and its place uh, in, in the world. Uh, on access, Ken has always been noted as someone who has tremendous access to uh, elites, elite actors in our own country and elite actors in China. Now, this has often conjured up some envy and uh, uh, discomfort from his academic colleagues because Ken is alone in uh, beginning observations at academic conferences and the like by saying, uh, when I was shaving with Chairman Mao this morning, uh, and then uh, <laughs> offers some nugget uh, uh, of insight. Uh, but this is one of the things which I think characterizes Ken's career and his, uh, his analysis of China. Finally, on mentoring, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Ken uh, was, uh, was a tremendous figure here at the University of Michigan. It continues as a tremendous figure uh, at, at the Brookings Institution in terms of training all of us and pushing us in the right direction. This, is, this fact is embodied by the presence here tonight and certainly tomorrow of many of Ken's uh, former students who are now uh, fill the ranks of all the splendid faculties in this country and Europe, the people who uh, analyze uh, China and try to understand China. I will say that Ken's, uh, the breadth of his mentoring is very wide. When I first came to Michigan, he called me up and invited me over to uh, Ken and Jane's home to watch something called the Michigan-Ohio State football game. I didn't really know what that was, but I wandered in and there was uh, Jane with hors d'oeuvres, which were in blue and maize. I recall I didn't understand what blue and maize meant. Uh, but uh, Ken certainly mentored me as to how to watch an Ohio State-Michigan <laughs> football game. He uh, taught me what you wear when you're watching a Michigan-Ohio uh, State football game in the privacy of your own home. He taught me that funny little dance that you dance when Michigan scores a touchdown. Uh, and he taught me that funny little dance. Uh, it's a sad dance when Michigan loses to Ohio State. Uh, so I've spoken enough. Uh, what I'd like to do now is invite Ken Lieberthal to come up to the podium uh, so we can enjoy access uh, to his uh, keen insight and understanding about China. And he can mentor us in trying to make intelligible the very complicated uh, issues uh, impacting the U.S.-China relationship. Ken. Uh, thank you very much, Nico. I have to say, <clears throat> I truly don't know what to say after that introduction. Uh, the, uh, maybe what I should begin with is what I feel most deeply, which is to say it just feels like I'm really coming home to come back here to Michigan uh, this weekend. I can't tell you how much it means to me, and especially to be back here as part of the 50th anniversary celebration of the Center for Chinese Studies uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, I know most of you have uh, anywhere from deep to passing familiarity with the center. To my mind, this center has, has been a leader in four major areas over a half a century now. Uh, in original scholarship in both the humanities and social sciences, in training not only the current generation, but several generations of scholars who have shaped the study of China, not only in the US, but in Europe uh, and in Asia. Uh, also in public education that the center is always taking extremely seriously, and in public policy and US-China relations. And we've had various folks from the center be uh, participants from one way or another uh, in the active policy arena. So being invited back to be part of the 50th anniversary celebration just frankly, means an enormous amount to me. I'm delighted to see that CCS remains vibrant uh, and really appreciate Mary Gallagher's leadership of it. Um, uh, it. And it's just a fantastic institution. What I want to do tonight with you is to focus on US-China relations, 
I want to do uh, maybe a mild version of what Nick was saying I could do, which is to say look to the future and try to anticipate uh, what are the forces that will really be shaping this relationship uh, as we go forward, and in doing that, to get beyond a little bit the headline kinds of issues and look a little bit deeper uh, into the relationship. Uh, but first, let me begin with a few comments on getting to here. Uh, the Obama administration came in to office in January of 2009 uh, really determined to avoid what had been the pattern in U.S.-China relations ever since the 1970s, which is where each president came into office having said that he would be tougher on China than his predecessor, setting off a year or more of tension and miscommunication, which then eventually got patched up as U.S. policy became more in line with what the predecessor had done and then built on that. And President Obama thought that was the wrong way to get off. Uh, more than that, he felt that China's role in the world had become sufficiently significant that one of his major objectives was to deal with China not only bilaterally and regionally, but also as a major player on global issues, especially the issues of economic recovery. Keep in mind this was at the height of the global financial crisis of uh, addressing climate change, this was in the run up to Copenhagen, uh, and also nuclear nonproliferation, not only with North Korea, but with Iran and elsewhere. Uh, this worked relatively well. Uh, and the first year of the Obama administration went quite smoothly through the president's visit, state visit to Beijing in November of that year. But then afterwards, things began to go downhill. Copenhagen proved to be very contentious. We were not in line with the Chinese there. We patched it up, but this was not anything that anyone was going to brag about in the wake of the conference. And then during the course of 2010, the perception was from the Chinese side that we were taking steps that they thought we had uh, gotten beyond. Taiwan arms sales, having the Dalai Lama visit the White House, and that kind of thing. Things they should have anticipated, but uh, we're hopeful that President Obama would tread more lightly. Uh, and they, for their side, and I think for largely internal reasons, began to press on a lot of issues around Asia in a more hard-edged fashion uh, than the region had become accustomed to. So this created a dynamic that plunged relations into a kind of downward slide until late in the year when President Obama went to, uh, I'm sorry, when Hu Jintao we began to prepare for Hu Jintao to come to the United States in January of 2011. In the run up to that, things began to get back on track. Uh, so that downward spiral was reversed only in the fourth quarter of 2010. Both sides have found that frequent, very high level contacts have been necessary to put US China relations on an even keel and keep them there. I've mentioned the two state visits going in both directions, but now if you look at it, we have. Uh, very high level, strategic level uh, visits back and forth scheduled at least every six months. And the reason is that preparing for those visits, no one wants one of those visits to go badly. So the staffs on both sides work very hard to, to get issues moving in the right direction in anticipation of the top bosses getting together. And that actually provides a lot of impetus to get the relationship uh, moving forward and out of the trouble that it tends to slide into. And as of 2011, I think it's fair to say, it's very clear neither side wants to rock the boat. Both sides have very extensive experience in dealing with each other. This is really a mature relationship in any, uh, by any definition. Both know how to manage most of the normal issues that come up in this relationship. So you know how to, how to keep things from spiraling out of hand. And both, moreover, recognize how vital it is to handle well a relationship that arguably is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. And so both want to avoid having problems in any one area, for example, Taiwan arms sales, uh, spill over so that they affect the entire relationship. So that's kind of getting us to here and positioning us. We have a, an extraordinarily deep, wide-ranging, candid relationship. We want stability moving forward. We know how to deal with each other. So what's the problem? And I want to indicate four fundamental areas where I think that there are issues coming up, issues already in train, but that will be key issues in shaping how this relationship evolves uh, in the coming years. Let me mention now, since I'm dealing with fundamental issues, in the q and I'm happy to talk about Chinese currency or Taiwan arms sales or Tibet or whatever 
you know, topical issue you want to raise. I want, in my prepared remarks, to frame some, uh, some more fundamental issues uh, and hope that that is helpful uh, for our subsequent discussion. Issue number one is the one that I'm going to spend a little more time on than the others. Uh, it's what the Chinese would call economic rebalancing. Uh, rebalancing is simply shifting your, your strategy of economic management, shifting your priorities, doing things in a significantly different fashion. And the reality is that the economic situation in both countries now requires major changes in order to pave the way for long-term sustainable growth. Our problems are different. What is common is that neither country can continue on the path it has been following in a sustainable fashion. I'm not using sustainable in a narrow environmental way. I mean to prevent major economic catastrophe. Okay? So this is a very big issue. And China, for example, recognizes it needs to shift to a new development model in order to sustain a reasonably solid basis for future growth. And uh, for the US, it's clear we have to gain control over our fiscal problems while still finding a way to invest in our future competitiveness. Rebalancing, I would argue, is strongly in the interest of each country. Uh, for example, for the United States, you know, with all the things you might consider about our future global prospects, there is nothing that will drive our future role in the world more than the answer to the question of whether we can bounce back from our current fiscal malaise. Uh, if we can, our future is very strong. And if we cannot, it's going to be very unpleasant. Uh, and uh, so the answer here is more inside of this country than what we do externally. What we do inside will affect hugely not only our capabilities externally, but also others' expectations of us externally. Uh, so what each side does is strongly in its own interest. What I think is insufficiently appreciated is what each of us needs to do is enormously in the interest of the other country. Each of us has a huge interest in the successful rebalancing efforts of the other uh, government. Uh, for example, China is now hugely invested in the health of the US dollar. So they are deeply concerned with how well we manage our economy and how our currency does. Uh, China's reform measures seek to move ahead in a major fashion domestic consumption as a driver of the Chinese economy. Domestic consumption in China means more exports from the US to China and more job availability in the US. We have a huge interest in that. Uh, so this works back and forth. It obviously is more detailed than that. But the basic point is that economic rebalancing is very much in the interest of each country itself and very, very much in the interest of the other country, too. So that to the extent that each country succeeds in economic rebalancing, US-China relations will therefore likely experience far fewer economic and trade tensions. To the, succeed that each, to the extent that each falls short, the obverse is true. Okay? So let me look at that issue a little bit. I want to do it primarily on the Chinese side, uh, because I think all of you have your own views about the prospects on, on the US side. And I'm not any more expert on that than any of you are. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that kind of debate. Uh, so let me focus on the Chinese side. And I would say that the prospect for economic rebalancing in China over, say, the coming five years or so are not very good. Uh, there are, the Chinese have laid out in the 12th five-year plan that was adopted this March a new development model that differs very significantly from the model they followed for the last 30 years. So in their typical pragmatic fashion, they've looked at what they've been doing. They recognize how successful it's been. They also realize that for a variety of reasons, it is simply unsustainable, already high cost, and the cost is becoming prohibitive. Uh, and so they laid out where they want to move from here in a very different uh, balance in their economy. But the problem is the priorities of the former model are now really baked into the current political system, especially in the incentives and opportunities for local leaders. Local leaders in China means leaders of provinces, cities, counties, and townships, everything below the level of the national government. Okay? And let me uh, go through that a little bit to uh, explain it in a little more detail. China's political economy, political economy is simply the way the 
political system interacts with the economy. Right? China's political economy has made the political system into a growth machine. Uh, China is the opposite of India, to my mind, or close to the opposite. In India, the political system in many ways acts to inhibit growth, simply by the way the system ap uh, operates. In China, rapid growth is a necessary outcome of the way the political system itself operates internally. So that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, has in reality become the Chinese bureaucratic capitalist party. Official power is fully harnessed to rapid economic growth. And, and it is through what, this is my term, you'll never hear it in China, but what I would describe as a kind of deal that's done between the top political leaders at any level of the system and those at the next level down. So between provincial leaders and municipal mayors, or municipal mayors and the county leaders, or county leaders and the leaders of the townships under the county. Okay, you know, you can, it's the same deal in each of those uh, levels. And the deal basically is the higher level, say if you take province and cities within the province, the provincial leaders, the party leaders, uh, you know, the party secretary and the top few people, appoint leaders of the cities. There's a procedure that's gone through that covers that up slightly, but no one questions who makes the final decisions on this. So appoints the leaders of the cities, gives them enormous power over what they can do within their own locality with enterprises, with the court system, almost across the board. Gives them also the flexibility to make their GDP grow every year. And if they make their GDP grow every year and meet a couple of other criteria I'll get to in a minute, they reward them. They reward them with high performance evaluations, which means increasing the chances they can move up to govern a, a bigger and richer economy over time, and also looking the other way at corrupt activities. So, and there are a lot of ways in China, literally millions of ways, where yours and your family's personal wealth can uh, grow along with the economy that you are, whose GDP you are nurturing. Uh, what they demand in return basically are three things. GDP, I guess four things, GDP growth every year, Maintain social order, no major scale, what they would term mass incidents, that you do not overtly criticize what the higher levels are saying, so you are playing their game, but with local flexibility, and that no major embarrassment emanates from your domain. Huge product safety scandal, you know, uh, child kidnapping and sales, or whatever it may be. I mean, you don't embarrass the system itself. From the perspective of lower level leaders, therefore, their incentives are to produce GDP growth, maintain social order, prevent major embarrassing incidents, and in the process, enrich themselves and their families. Okay? What are the results of that set of incentives? Well, the political system produces very rapid economic growth as a necessary consequence of how this system operates. The incentives are there at every level of this five level massive political apparatus. That's a good thing. The system also promotes leaders who are entrepreneurial, who are capable, and who understand how to play the system. Also a good thing. As you go up the hierarchy in China, you meet a lot of very impressive people in the key positions of power. But there are some not so good things that come out of this too. There's a systemic bias toward major capital intensive projects. This is in a society with an abundance of labor. Uh, these produce visible signs of progress. You can point to the new bridges and the new buildings, et cetera, et cetera. They produce immediate employment. They produce GDP growth figures, if you look at the inputs into GDP. And they produce large streams of cash from which to skim. What's not to like? Not surprisingly, infrastructure gets built all over time. You cannot stop it because lo local leaders have the power and the incentive to go flat out to do it. Not for long-term strategic reasons, because this year it pays off, okay? Long-term strategically, it may not be a good investment. This year, politically, it's a very good investment. For reasons I'm not going to go into, but will in Q&A if you wish, this set of incentives also produces local protectionism, which breaks up the national market into a lot of smaller markets, extraordinary environmental degradation, and massive violations of intellectual property. So there are a lot of downsides to what occurs here. Uh, the system is so deeply embedded 
that it will take major changes in the incentive structure for local leaders throughout the country in order to produce major changes in the development model. Uh, but those changes will end up taking money out of the hands of these powerful local officials. So if you go back to the uh, kind of second bullet down here, the, uh, the priorities of the model being baked into the current political system in the way that I've just described uh, is something that would take a lot of political capital by the highest level leaders to change in a significant way. And the problem there is we're in the middle of a succession in China. Uh, the, uh, I'm in the middle of a search for the slide that I want to be on. Here we are. Uh, we're in the middle of a succession in China, and the succession makes it very difficult to get the highest level leaders to think about expending the political capital necessary to change the incentives for these leaders all the way down the system. I think it's going to be 2014 at the earliest before top leaders focus on this problem. And therefore, I think we'll see a lot of money spent in the direction of more service sector, clean technology, more resource efficiency, efficiency and resource use, more domestic consumption, household consumption, all the, all the things in the new model. But I don't think we're going to see it have very much in the way of macroeconomic results that are palpable. Uh, so I don't think this is going to go very well. On the U.S. side, as I mentioned, rebalancing also faces some steep political hurdles, as we see on television every day. Uh, and I will leave you with your own judgments on how that will come out. But the bottom lines are that there is potential for more serious economic trade and broader political frictions to the extent that these rebalancing efforts do fall short. Uh, I think there are things that can be done to mitigate this, even within this macro structure. To me, one of the more promising potential areas is a significant increase in direct Chinese investment in the U.S. economy. Uh, but that requires that they do a lot and that we do a lot, and, and uh, a lot has to be put together for that to occur. Anyway, issue number one, therefore, is e economic rebalancing. Uh, issue number, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Issue number two is succession politics. Uh, here, throughout East Asia, we have what I think is literally an unprecedented year coming up in 2012. Uh, we have a combination of election or succession for national leaders in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the United States, South Korea, Russia, uh, very possibly in Japan, they, you know, the data of that, the latest would be 2013, could be 2012. And in North Korea, they're in the middle of a succession. It's not clear what will happen during the course of 2012. Now, election and succession politics focus lead attention on domestic audiences and do not encourage external nuanced diplomacy. Uh, when the top leadership positions are at stake, uh, leaders look inward first and foremost and won't do things internationally that may make it more difficult to them, for them to secure the outcomes that they want domestically. Now, the U.S. and China are both deeply engaged throughout Asia, and the potential for increased U.S.-China tensions because of developments in succession or election politics in Asia is not small. Think, for example, what will happen if the DPP wins in, in the Taiwan election in January uh, Tsai Ing-wen would then not assume office as president until May, uh, but Hu Jintao has been the key strategist behind the policy that is really linked to Ma Ying-jeou, to Tsai Ing-wen's opponent. So the dynamics of that can become very tricky, uh, and the U.S. obviously is uh, deeply engaged in that issue. Within this, though, to me, the game changer issue potentially is North Korea, uh, because if North Korea should become massively unstable, Frankly, the U.S. and China are not at all coordinated on how we would respond to that uh, and the potential there, again, especially given the domestic politics that each leader faces during that time. Uh, the potential for real problems is uh, higher than anyone should be comfortable with. Uh, the U.S. and China also, of course, can become political footballs in each other's national political debates. I sat down uh, two days ago with some of the people who are deeply involved in the Romney campaign. <laughs> I have no you know, uh, stance here on whether Mitt Romney would make the best president or not. What impresses me is this is a man who has a deep business background, uh, 
His business had a lot to do with China over the years. And he is already running on the basis of how tough he is going to get on China if elected. And he's doing it, frankly, because his election depends on six states, four of which are Midwest industrial states, none of which are doing well economically. Uh, if a year from now he has the, the nomination and he is attacking Obama up and down uh, on Obama's economic program and how soft he is being on China economically, suppose the currency bill passes next year, you think Obama will sign it? I don't know, but I think the chances have become a lot greater because of the dynamics of domestic politics. So these kinds of things uh, do play out in ways that can be very unsettling. Uh, and if these dynamics move in the wrong direction, they certainly can sharpen tensions, keeping in mind everything that's going on in elite politics in Asia. They can sharpen tensions about both the US and Chinese positions overall in Asia. So let me turn to that as my third, uh, as my third uh, issue. Uh, Asian allies and friends have been turning to the United States, pleading with the United States to increase our active engagement in Asia diplomatically and militarily because they increasingly fear that China is leveraging its economic role in Asia, which is huge, for diplomatic and military advantage. And they want the US to offset that. Uh, and we frankly have been quite responsive. We've been quite responsive in no small part because if allies and friends come to us and say, we really need you to step up your game, and your response is, no, I think we're doing about the right thing right now, they take it as a signal that we're leaving the region. Right? If we aren't stepping up, then we're probably stepping out, especially when you look at US domestic fiscal problems and potential defense cuts and that kind of thing. So the Obama administration has really stepped up. I'm not sure how much you've seen in, uh, say, of Hillary Clinton's uh, piece in, uh, I forgot what term, foreign policy, I think it was, uh, just this past week, but lays out a very comprehensive approach to Asia. The bottom line message is we're stepping up in Asia, we aren't stepping down in Asia, and we're doing so in a major way. And you can look at that for details. The problem is China sees our enhanced engagement in Asia as designed to instigate anti-Chinese sentiment. In other words, what I've just said is it's in response to what friends and allies are asking us to do because they're worried about China. China thinks they aren't inherently worried about China. We're making them worried about China and we're pushing China into difficult positions and then using that to enhance our presence in the region because our real goal is to complicate China's rise and this will do it. In addition, Beijing, if you think about this on a more macro basis, Beijing has fully built Asia regionally into China's own economic system. Uh, you go back to 2000, to the year 2000, every major country in Asia conducted most of its foreign trade with the United States. As of 2011, every major country in Asia conducts most of its trade with China. Uh, investment has also gone into China. Asian countries systematically have bought into China's development as their future. So for China, Asia is a huge profit center. As we get drawn in on the basis that I've just been suggesting, it's more on the security side. Security is a huge cost center. Security is expensive. So my own feeling is we need to be very careful, especially given future US budget constraints, which will be hitting our military among other areas. We have to be very careful uh, that we do not uh, get in an unbalanced position in Asia. Uh, and we need to try to move things toward a deeper regional engagement, uh, both on the economic side especially, but also even on the security side to get China engaged with us where we can be mutually engaged. And there are a lot of issues where our interests are not antithetical. Uh, so that there is more burden sharing and security is somewhat less expensive for us in order to have the kind of region that we want. In short, we should not be overly satisfied by other countries coming to us 
to tell us how warmly they welcome our presence in Asia. That feels good, frankly, if you're an American national leader. Uh, but we need to be strategically mindful of the balance we strike there. And for example, in the South China Sea, we need to be very careful not to have Vietnam and the Philippines draw us into their territorial assertions and aspirations uh, and to defending those. That is not where our interests lie. We should be linked up much more closely with Indonesia that takes a law of the sea treaty principle as the way to approach all territorial disputes. And that very much conforms to where our interests are. But Vietnam and the Philippines certainly are working very hard to draw us in as closely as they can in support of their particular positions. And there are a lot of other things we could be doing there, but I just want to highlight that issue. Uh, and then the fourth and final issue is the issue of US-China strategic distrust. By strategic distrust, I mean distrust of the other's long-term intentions. I don't mean strategic, I mean just military or security. This is kind of, you know, what is this country all about uh, as we go forward into the future, and especially over the long run? And the reality is strategic distrust is low and is diminishing. I'm sorry, distrust is high and is growing. Trust is low and diminishing. And this is despite our extensive ongoing contacts and in fact, in reality, our interdependence on many issues. Uh, ironically, this problem has become more serious even as the two countries work together, and frankly, as our leaderships meet very frequently. It's rare to go a two-month period that President Obama and President Hu Jintao don't speak together. I mean, you know, this is really an extraordinary change from earlier uh, years. The Chinese popular narrative, and frankly, my sense is, I'm doing a project on this now, so I have a better sense in a couple of months, but my sense at this point is this is a narrative that is widely bought into in not all, but many of the Chinese governing bureaucracies up to just below the very highest levels. Whether Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao and you know, those folks really believe in this narrative, I'm not so sure. But they certainly have to cope with both public opinion and bureaucratic opinion that generally does believe in the narrative I'm about to lay out. And this narrative has several parts to it. One, the US is clearly number one in the world. But China is now the second largest economy. China is growing and has momentum at its back. The US, there's a debate as to how long the US will be as vibrant as it is. Some say we're already declining. Others say you know, we're around for quite a while. But everyone agrees we must be trying to hold back China, uh, prevent China from closing the gap with the US. The subtext is certainly if they were number one and we were number two, that's what they would be doing. So therefore, it you know, must be what's in the back of our own minds. Uh, this amounts to a wide-ranging conspiracy theory with a number of related sub-themes. Those who think the US is on the verge of slipping into decline argue that, that the US, therefore, will fight all the harder to hold China down. Uh, let me add in this context, if we get our fiscal house in order and we bounce back, that's going to change this narrative in China quite, I mean, they'll think differently about the American future and that will affect their internal deliberations. This narrative also argues that the US internally at the national level is highly strategic in its thinking, highly coordinated, intensely disciplined, and subtle and wide-ranging in its efforts to constrain or disrupt China's rise. In our dreams. <laughs> I have actually had the opportunity to communicate this uh, uh, at the end of the first year of the Obama administration. I was talking with, with the key people who make our policy uh, at our highest level. And I said, you know, the Chinese really think we are, and I gave this list. And literally, it produced just laughter around the table and say, basically, you aren't serious. They must know us better than that, <laughs> right? But there is this, this faith, if you will, in US skills, right? We've got to be that good. And even those who argue the US is, is on a path to decline nevertheless feel the US at this point remains so powerful that almost anything in the world that goes against China's interests must be the result of US hidden initiatives. 
So this is played out, for example, on Libya, all the US plot to deny China access to oil. Uh, Burma's recent cancellation of a dam project shows how the US is in there trying to disrupt China's major investments in Burma. Uh, in the South China Sea developments, it is the US who is instigating the others to press their territorial claims. You name it, the US is behind it, right? Uh, and it also reflects an underlying notion that great power relations ultimately are zero sum in nature, which is to say, if the other side's winning, we're losing. And if we're winning, they're losing, right? So if you look at the US side of this, it's a somewhat different picture, but it's still a set of problems. The US narrative is we in the world will benefit if China succeeds and becomes a constructive player in the global system. I literally, I've had the privilege of being involved in White House level discussions over quite a period of years now on China's in serious discussion of, of what we ought to be doing in short term and longer term. I have never once heard a White House policy discussion that focused on disrupting China's rise instead of influencing how a rising China behaves in the world. There's a big difference between those two positions. And that difference recognizes that we lack the capability to constrain China's rise. And frankly, that a China that fails badly will create problems for the world that no one knows how to manage. Well, a rising China creates problems that we do know how to manage and that have a lot of good spin-off effects for the world and global growth and alleviation of poverty, in all kinds of areas, if China behaves as a responsible global player. So I wouldn't say that we don't care how China acts and we just support the rise. We support the rise of a constructive China. Uh, and within this, the discussion really is in terms of a positive sum relationship, where if we cooperate, there are win-win opportunities out there across a wide array of areas. But I will say, there is in the back of the minds of a lot of folks a real concern. And the real concern is that as we access what the Chinese say to each other, about managing the relationship with the US. Not what Hu Jintao says when he's in Washington, you know, addressing a large public audience or even addressing Barack Obama, but what they say to each other sometimes when they don't know we're listening, it's zero sum, right? And the question is, if you have a major country that's becoming more powerful that continues to think in zero sum terms, then you have to worry about how they'll use their power. Will they use it to undermine our capabilities, right? And if that is the case, then are their professions of goodwill and their desire to cooperate intended really to mislead us? And what should we be doing about that? I think it's a, it's a difficult issue, frankly. Uh, we also tend to think that China's government is internally strategic, coordinated, disciplined, and subtle in their dreams. Anyone who, uh, who knows the Chinese government well, Andy Murtha has written entire books about this. Uh, anyone who knows the Chinese government well knows that they are scrambling to wrap a rationale around a set of actions that, they, that are not strategic, discipline, coordinated, et cetera. Uh, and so each of us tends to mirror image and from a distance see a degree of purposefulness on the other side that reality does not support. Let me add that the military component of our relationship is not one that is going to increase mutual trust in the coming 15 years or so. Our fundamental military postures in Asia are going to increase distrust over the coming 15 years. You already know that because militaries don't turn on a dime. Future weapon systems are already funded. Future doctrines are already well developed. You know. And let me say, our militaries are not going to be the source of keen friendship between us. We have to keep them from fighting each other, but each of them will provide an impetus for budgets and other things of the other. Okay? So we will really need to build distrust, I'm sorry, build trust uh, around the distrust that the, that the military is uh, continuing to impart to the relationship. So I think strategic distrust thus runs the serious risk of becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and it's a highly corrosive element uh, in a relationship. 
question is, what would it take to change these mutual perceptions? And frankly, the answers are not obvious. Uh, it's extremely hard to disprove a conspiracy theory. Because frankly, when you do something that doesn't conform to the conspiracy theory, the, the, those who hold the theory say, ah, just shows how subtle and tricky they are. <laughs> what they're doing to cover up their conspiracy. Right? So it's very hard to get out of that box. Let me make a few concluding comments. Uh, if there is no unexpected major crisis like North Korea that occurs, North Korean meltdown that occurs, I think we're very likely to see no significant new initiatives during the coming year and a half in US-China relations. Everyone knows President Obama is up for re-election. Everyone knows the Chinese succession is going to play out in October of 2012 in the party congress and the following March uh, on the government side. Uh, everyone knows this is not a time to rock the boat. Uh, and so we'll see very attentive management of tensions and irritations by both sides in order to keep things on an even keel. But under the surface, I would argue that this is a time of potentially major change. Especially over the coming four to five years, the most consequential component will be how effective each country is in its own domestic economic rebalancing. I really think that's the most fundamental driver out there as we look to, say, a five-year period or so. Uh, the broader positioning of each country in Asia is also shifting in ways that over a five-year period or so can be really quite significant. So we need very serious attention to this, more conscious attention to it than I think either side is giving at this point. Uh, I think on balance, a great deal is likely to contribute to growing strategic distrust, which is going to make everything else more difficult over the longer term. I think it therefore behooves both sides to think more clearly about two things. One, those actions that most strongly contribute to strategic distrust on the other side. What do we do that pushes their buttons and undermines their confidence in our long-term intentions? And secondly, what change, what could we do differently that would actually produce a significantly different assessment. Again, those are not easy issues, but let me uh, conclude my formal remarks with them. Thank you very much. I'm happy, again, as I mentioned before, to take uh, questions on anything uh, with two conditions. One, every question has to have the word China in it, and every question ends in a question mark. Okay, uh, with that in mind, Connie? Uh, I saw a fabulous cartoon in the China Daily last week that I wish I'd brought home with me. It had several frames contrasting Republican and Democratic positions on various issues, on the environment, on taxes, on social issues. And then the last frame said, the thing on which they agree is that they don't like China. Mm -hmm. Would you please contrast the Republican and Democratic Party views or leaders' views on China? Who are the Republican leaders? <laughs> uh, no, I meant, I mean, that's a serious question right now. They're debating every day. Um, I think what, is, what has generally been true in the past remains true at the core of each party, which is to say the Republicans are much more free trade oriented and uh, therefore in general have been uh, better from a Chinese perspective on, e on economic and trade issues. Democrats have tended to be more protectionist. Uh, Democrats also tend to focus on human rights more. Uh, so the Democrats, ironically, the, re the Chinese tend to like conservative Republican presidents. Right, because they 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 kind of hard nosed. Let's just build the relationship, type folks, uh, and uh, so George W. Bush did very well in China. You know, I think, frankly, and I'm I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being serious when I say this. They thought George W. Bush was the perfect president because he liked China. He uh, was prepared to be tough on Taiwan and keep his word to the Chinese on Taiwan. Uh, he followed through on what he said he would do in U.S.-China relations and he weakened America in every other way. <laughs> so what's not to like from their perspective, right? The uh, uh, Democrats, they generally have trouble with uh, because they focus on human rights issues. You know, China becomes much more symbolic for Democrats. Uh, human rights issues, 
uh, trade, you're stealing our jobs, you're undermining our way of life, all that kind of thing. Uh, and Democrats somehow or other feel they have to show that they are not weak on national security and therefore can actually, in a peculiar way, be tougher on China on, on the security side than the Republicans were. Uh, and I think those, those sentiments still run fairly strong strategically in each party. Uh, having said that, uh, let me make three other comments. One, always during presidential elections, the only exception since the Nixon visit in 1972 was 2008, the Obama-McCain race. With that sole exception, every presidential election has been characterized by negative rhetoric about China, where the party on the outs uh, has criticized the party on the in, you know, the incumbent party, on the basis they've been too soft on China. So whether it's Bill Clinton's butchers of Beijing or what, you name it, that's been the constant refrain. Secondly, every, new, every president, once they're in office for a short period of time, realizes that the previous incumbent to the office had pretty much the right set of policies on China and finds a face-saving way to move back to them and then build on them so that the campaigns don't anticipate the relationship over the long run, although they may create problems over the short run. That's what worries me about the Romney campaign, by the way. If he's elected, assuming he keeps on his current kind of track vis-a-vis -vis China, he's going to find this hard to climb out of some of the positions that he said he'll take. Like, on day one, I'll designate China as a currency manipulator. And uh, those will be, those will cause a lot of trouble in the first couple of years. I mean, it will really take quite a while to climb back to where we are on the day before he assumes office. Right? Uh, number three, for tactical reasons, I've just given you the strategic profile of each party. For tactical reasons, you can find them all over the lot. Right? So, um, these, in the Senate, the Senate passed a, a currency bill against China. That was overwhelmingly uh, with Democratic and Republican support. It was fully, you know, it, it was fully uh, bipartisan. Uh, that won't get through the House, I believe. The main reason it won't get through the House is because of conservative Republican opposition. Uh, the main reason conservative Republicans oppose it is because they see it as a revenue-raising bill because it would apply tariffs to Chinese import, raise tariffs on Chinese imports. That would be the net effect. That would feed the beast. It would give the national government more money than it currently has. So on principle, they oppose it. It has nothing to do with China, right? So you can get tactical considerations that move folks in almost every which way, given the complexities of our government. But I think the, the long-term strategic positions remain pretty much what they've been in the past and what I tried to outline for you. With that answer, no one wants to ask another question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dick DeLamelaire, attorney. Uh, what is the present status of uh, China honoring patent rights, trademark rights, copyrights? You know, China's uh, formal laws governing intellectual property are very good. Uh, they're an adherent to, I think, every major international convention on this. They made a number of efforts domestically to uh, give those laws teeth, especially in the major eastern metropolises like Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou. They have intellectual property rights courts, uh, which are actually fairly qualified to deal with what are complicated and difficult issues. Having said that, their record is terrible. Uh, and it's terrible, I think, for two reasons. One reason is, as a matter of national strategy, Chinese government, like every current industrialized country at some point in its development, other than England, everyone other than England, uh, has depended on theft of intellectual property to kickstart their economy, right? We did it from the Brits. You know, everyone has done it. England didn't do it only because they came first. There's no one to do it with, right? But, uh, but then you count, and this will get to the second reason why their record is lousy. You count on, over time, a natural evolution of where you begin to develop indigenous firms that have the capability to become innovative, to develop intellectual property, and to want to protect it. They become more important players in their own system, 
And so the system moves, you know, the center of gravity moves toward increasing protection of intellectual property, right? And we've seen that in every country. No country becomes perfect, but moving from here to here is very significant for how that economy functions and your capacity to protect intellectual property. A big problem in China is this political economy that I talked about before. Because when you sue for intellectual property violation in China, you have to sue in the locality that produced the counterfeit product. Not where it was sold, but where it was produced. But in that locality, the counterfeit firm is often regarded by the local political leadership as downright upright. Right? Generates taxes, generates employment, generates GDP growth. Firm based in Shanghai, Shanghai government may be going nuts because their firms are being undermined, but they have no reach out to someplace in Hunan, right? So there are areas of China where counterfeiting, where the array of intellectual property theft and, and, and utilization of that for profit is their core competence. Okay, and fully protected by local leaders. And the system needs to evolve a lot before you can undermine that. Uh, and you would really have to change the incentives of local leaders. So they no longer engage, I, I didn't talk about this explicitly, but let me say, currently local leaders engage firms in their bailiwicks at a microeconomic level, firm by firm. Uh, many firms, both public and private sector in China, regard key competitive advantages. How close can I get to the government? Not like you normally assume in companies, you want to be as far from the government as you can. The competitive advantage isn't drawn close. Right? So this is a kind of nexus that really produces a lot of, uh, a lot of outcomes like protecting counterfeiters, because they're good for the local economy. And, the, and it's very hard to get at them. Even if you successfully sue them in a local court, the judgment almost certainly is not going to be one that's going to put those folks out of business. Right? So it remains a very difficult situation, and I think is going to be very difficult. There'll be some improvements, but fundamentally, there's going to be a real problem for a long time to come. Even as their own patent system has been exploding in terms of size and registered patents and all that kind of stuff, the fundamentals are uh, this is a major problem for foreign technology. Uh, now, sir, you, you had a question. If we have a mic down here, please. Yes, besides the conspiracy theories containing the protocols of the wise men of Washington and Beijing, what is the actual feeling of the people making business on both sides of the ocean? Uh, I think, you know, there are uh, a lot of feelings because we're dealing with a lot of folks in different industries and different backgrounds and that kind of thing. I think uh, fundamentally, uh, American corporations have been a mainstay of the U.S.-China relationship. I mean, politically, they have gone to bat for this relationship uh, repeatedly. Um, it's interesting, when you talk, and I, even when you look at surveys that our chambers of commerce do in Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou, uh, sentiment is changing. Now, you have the ironic situation where business has never been better. They're making more money. Most of them are investing to grow their businesses. Um, you know, things are going very well. But they think the trend is in the wrong direction. That increasingly regulations are being either written or enforced in discriminatory ways. That sentiment is moving against them as the Chinese try to promote their own national champions, their own local brands, and so forth. Uh, and so they're very worried about the future. And you see in Washington now, they aren't nearly as willing to go to bat as they were even two or three years ago. Uh, so that's a, you know, that's a significant shift in sentiment. Uh, Chinese businesses, I'm not as confident I have my finger on the pulse of them. They're doing a lot of things. Most Chinese businesses for a long time have been very happy to operate just in China because there's so much low-hanging fruit in China, given a rapidly growing economy. Uh, and many have been very happy to have foreign businesses there because they learn management and they get technology and there's capital injected and all that, and they've been very good at learning you know, from those experiences. I think now Chinese companies, at least the better ones, are increasingly thinking about how you make money abroad. 
They began by investing mostly in natural resources, which are relatively, they're large, but relatively simple type investments. They then expanded into a whole array of commercial and manufacturing investments, but generally in countries right around China's periphery or in developing countries, especially in Africa. Right? They're now trying to move into Europe and North America. Europe, much faster than North America. And at this point, North America is still seeing, especially the United States, is still seeing as basically a hostile environment. So investment has been growing here, but everyone is aware of the huge embarrassments that, for example, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation suffered when it tried to acquire Unicom, uh, or that Huawei has suffered uh, in several things it's tried to do here. Um, and so, and the last thing in the world they want to do is be embarrassed publicly. So they need a lot of reassurance uh, and a lot of, frankly, guidance as to how you handle local governments and the media and, and uh, the fact that we're serious about environmental laws and equal opportunity laws and discrimination laws. And, you know, we have a very tough environment if you aren't used to this. It's going to take a while. Uh, so I think at this point they want to come. They're very nervous about coming. Some are in here. But it's a huge opportunity if we could do better on it. Uh, but both sides have a lot of work to do. I'll, I'll add one more comment about that. One thing that generates, in my experience, an unbelievable, no, I'm sorry, all too believable and justified level of outrage in China is our visa process, uh, where we insist that any visa applicant actually show up physically at a US embassy or consulate for an interview which will be scheduled at the convenience of the embassy, not infrequently after the time that they were supposed to have been in the United States. Uh, when they finally get the visa interview, it generally lasts a maximum of two minutes, uh, at which time they are told whether they've been granted the visa or not. These are arbitrary decisions. Pardon me? They have to be fingerprinted. I didn't hear. They have and they also have to be fingerprinted, yes, but that, that's also insulting. But fingerprinting, I don't mind, because that is a legitimate security kind of issue, although we have yet to identify our first terrorist from China, let me say. But, and most of these came in after 9-11. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the rest of this process is obscene. Uh, and you would be astonished at the people who have been turned down. It would blow your mind. Vice ministers are turned down. Heads of the biggest research organizations in China are turned down. And it's arbitrary, absolutely arbitrary. And it is outrageous. Uh, and there is enormous anger over it. So, you know, my feeling is if Gary Locke, as the new ambassador, has one signature issue, it ought to be getting our visa system working in a reasonable fashion. Uh, and it would do a world of good for us. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Dalai Lama's visit to the White House last year. It seemed like it was a delicate balance. The Obama administration was trying to strike. They delayed it. They had it. And they had him exit by what seemed like staged trash bags and barrels to seem to say it wasn't a serious visit. So there's two questions. Um, what were the policy thinker, thinkers on our side thinking about? And what's the end game from China's point of view vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, foreign relations and, and the Dalai Lama's role? Well, uh, first of all, from our point of view, uh, the, uh, the initial opportunity for, the, for His Holiness to visit the White House was in October of 2009. The President's state visit to China was in November of 2009. And the President believes quite strongly, and I think rightly, that you don't want to do something that the other side will see will see as egregiously insulting right before you go for a state visit. I mean, it's just not smart. So the White House said in October that we are not inviting the Dalai Lama. When pressed, I mean, they didn't announce this, but you know, it got out. We're not inviting him now, but he will be welcome at a point in the future. The next time the Dalai Lama came, as I recall, was February of 2010. And at that point, he was invited to the White House. Uh, I think that was quite understandable. How he was treated at the White House was exactly the way he is always treated by every recent president. Uh, you, you do not meet the president in the Oval Office uh, you, or in the Roosevelt Room. You don't meet him in the West Wing. 
uh, you meet him in the residence part of the White House, downstairs typically in a place called the Map Room, very prestigious room, a lot of history has occurred there, but is not official, is considered the residence, uh, and it's treated as an unofficial visit uh, of a spiritual leader for whom we have profound respect. And I think that's about the right treatment. Uh, the, um, how the Chinese deal with all this, I think about as badly as you can deal with it, frankly. Uh, what, you know, what the Chinese don't understand, when I say the Chinese, I mean, you know, Chinese policy, okay? I mean, the individual Chinese have different views, have a variety of views. But at a policy level, uh, they absolutely refuse to concede that the Dalai Lama is recognized by anyone as a spiritual leader, right? To them, he is 100% a political figure who leads an exile government that challenges de facto the government that governs Tibet. In fact, won't even recognize the boundaries of the Tibet Autonomous Region as the boundaries of Tibet. Because in fact, it divides up what are basically Tibetan areas on the High Tibetan Plateau. Uh, because they'll only treat him as a political figure, they're out of step with virtually everyone else in the world. You know, I've noticed when he's come to the University of Michigan, we've welcomed him here going back to the 1980s, as I recall, at various times, he draws an enormous crowd in Chrysler Arena when he has a spiritual session, when he talks about ethics and Buddhist teachings and that kind of thing. Thousands of people come, right? Citizens of the state of Michigan, most of whom are Buddhists. They aren't there because he leads an exile government. They're there because he's a revered man, you know, in the Buddhist tradition. He is, uh, you know, he is a lama, and at the top of the hierarchy uh, of, uh, of the Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition. So, you know, I think the Chinese get this very wrong. Clearly, their strategy is to wait until he dies. His successor will obviously be a child, right? And they figure they then have the dominant hand. They will try to pick his successor. He is threatening to name his successor before he expires. I frankly don't know how you do that if the successor is supposed to be the reincarnation of, I mean, I just don't know how that works. But I, you know, he knows better than I do. I mean, you know, I don't, sorry, I don't know how that goes. But uh, I think China is in fact, has in fact set itself up for a much greater problem than it otherwise would have had. Uh, I've had the privilege of getting to know the Dalai Lama over the years. Not, not, close, but I've met him you know, a num quite a number of times. And uh, I really believe that he is absolutely serious, and has been absolutely serious, when he said what he wants is to preserve Tibetan culture, absolutely recognizes that politically, Tibet is a part of China, uh, absolutely will affirm that economically, in many ways, what's happening in Tibet was necessary. But he fears the cultural and spiritual consequences of that, and he thinks he can play a significant role in it. Uh, and he also thinks that Tibetan culture can re reestablish its traditional role as a bridge between China and India, which it has really lost. Right? So I think that's his real view. They want to wait him out because they don't trust him. And the, uh, the bottom line of that is that while he's not a separatist, his successors very likely are. Younger Tibetan movement, I am told, is deeply angry at how he's handled all of this, uh, and much more radical than he is. Uh, so I think the Chinese are actually missing their best opportunity to uh, reconcile things in Tibet in a way that's viable going forward. They're creating a massive problem. We see now there are young nuns who are you know, committing self-immolation. How long can that go on without something clicking somehow, yeah, I mean, without a level of, of questioning a basic policy. Uh, Ken, we're, let's not exhaust Ken, so let's have this be the last question. Well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. My name's Rachel Goodstein. I'm an alum of the China Center, 1974. Um, my question goes back to the U.S. politics, and in your opinion, would the Chinese like to see President Obama reelected? I'm sorry, with the Chinese government? Like to see President Obama reelected. Re I think what they have found generally is that once a president has been in office for four years, 
Uh, they know them pretty well, and they always prefer what they know to what they don't. And so I think the answer would be they'd be quite comfortable with his continuing in office because it's an ongoing thing. And we are now working very hard on getting, you know, the the designated, I mean, the almost certain person who will take over from Hu Jintao is Xi Jinping. And uh, he hosted Vice President Biden uh, in August. He'll be coming to the U.S. probably in January. Uh, we'll have very extensive exposure, not only to the vice president, but the president and top cabinet officials and so forth. So we're building in, beginning to gain the familiarity with the successors coming in. And I think that's something that they feel uh, more comfortable with. After all, we are not, he isn't getting together with Vice President Biden because Vice President Biden will become president, right? But we are doing it because he will become president and head of the party. So I think that that's, uh, you know, their comfort level is a little higher with that, but they'll work with whoever comes in because that's what you do. Okay, thank you very much.